Good morning, church. Go ahead and open up your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Matthew, chapter 16. Uh, uh, so I, I did not update our, uh, our tech people on that. Sorry, we're not studying Hebrews anymore. Um, we are doing, we are doing uh, just a, a couple weeks before we walk into a series that's called What Would Jesus Say? So we're going to talk about some really interesting things in that series, excited about uh, having everybody here uh, for that, but go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 16. Couple things that I want to announce today but before we get started. Number one is that our youth pastor here and his wife, mainly his wife, have had a baby. Uh, his name is Ezra. We're going to go ahead and put that up there. There he is. Uh, and so they're not here today, which I thought was a super lame excuse. Uh, <laughs> That's going to come up in his review, but uh, I'm totally joking. No, they are, they are celebrating. Obviously, that, that happened this last week, so we want to make sure uh, that you all know healthy, everybody's great, and now they are about to lose even more sleep than they thought was possible with uh, two children now instead of just one. Also, I wanted to make an announcement. Tonight, we are having our uh, end of summer bash. Are you guys, you guys ready for this? End of summer? All the kids are like, no. <laughs> All the parents are like, please, please. End of summer bash that's happening at the Gunnersville campus. All three campuses are coming together at Gunnersville. We are going to have a <laughs> baptism service. Uh, sorry, that's me, crack a lacking. Um, we are going to have a baptism service in the lake. And so we want to invite you. We've got some folks from our campus that are going to be uh, baptized there as well. And then there's going to be some food trucks, some hot dogs and sausages. But I have to make a, an important announcement, okay? I need the church to step up here. We are the body of Christ. We're going to talk about that today. I need a very important announcement. Snow cone thing fell through. I exa Thank you. I know. I'm with you. Oh, man. So here's the thing. If anybody in the room knows how to make homemade ice cream, now's your time. Jesus is calling. <laughs> okay? We have an opportunity here to have uh, home. We're going to do homemade ice cream. So I know it's last minute, but anybody who has the ability to make some ice cream and bring that, we may even put together some sort of an ice cream taste off and figure out. Who made the best homemade ice cream? We're not going to give you anything for winning it, but at the very least, you'll be able to walk away with the pride of knowing that you have made the best homemade ice cream. So seriously, if anybody has that ability, we do want to have dessert uh, for everybody that will obviously be uh, provided, and we weren't able to secure our, our snow truck, um, our snow truck, snow cone truck um, to be there. So if you have that ability, you, can, you don't even have to tell me, just bring it. Um, but if you could tell me afterwards so I can kind of know how many uh, people might be available to do that, I would be very, very appreciative. Now that we're done with all the important stuff, let's dive right into Scripture this morning. We're going to talk about one of my favorite things to talk about, which is the church. And uh, I'm going to be honest with you, it's interesting, a couple weeks ago, so I don't know if you know, know this, but our roof leaks here... Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you guys, I know, shocking, isn't it? So, you know, and so there's, there's quite a bit of time during the week that I'll spend coming and cleaning up. We try to put out buckets, but you never know. It's like a groundhog. You don't know where it's going to pop up next. And um, so it, it's kind of misses, and so I got to come and clean up. And I was frustrated, man. A couple weeks ago, I was just like, man. And I was, I was cleaning up some water, trying to get a stain out of the carpet. And I was like, man. I, 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 this church, I was like, this church, I'm so frustrated. And God, has God ever given you a spanking? Anybody here? Yeah. That happened to me in that moment. And God's like, Psh. and I was like, what? And he says, this isn't the church. This is, a, this is a building. This is where the church meets. And don't get me wrong, I'm grateful that we have a place to meet and all of that. And I'm not, I'm not doing this just to whine about, <laughs> about those frustrations, but it was one of those moments where I thought, man, you know, 
Sometimes we think about church as a place to go or a specific location. We call it the church, which isn't necessarily wrong, but the understanding of what the church is needs to be so much deeper than that because God has not placed um, a blessing on one location, on one building, on brick and mortar or uh, you know, metal and wood. That's not, that's not what God is, is saying. He has called us to be the church. You and me, and in that moment, God said, you're the church. This isn't the church. You are. We are the church. And it's so important for us to understand as we unpack that, what that means. Because we may, we may say that, oh yeah, okay, we're the church, blah, 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 right? And then we just go about our day. But what, is that, what does that mean? The Bible says we're two or more are gathered in my name, I will be in their midst also. And that's not necessarily just dealing with the church, but God has called us as individuals to be the church. God came up with this idea, right? We didn't create the idea of church. Jesus did. And I figure anything that Jesus came up with, probably a good idea, right? Probably something that we're, want, we're gonna wanna follow hard after. It's not a man-made institution. It is God-ordained. Matthew chapter 16 Verses 15 through 18. Again, if you've been around church for any period of time, you've probably heard some of these verses before, but we're gonna dig a little bit. We're gonna look a little bit at what some of these things mean for us. If you have your smart device with you, you can follow along. I know we don't have anything printed out this morning for you, but you can go to the Bible app, go to live events, uh, 35016, if you don't have your location turned on, and you'll be able to see those notes and follow along with us. Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 18. Jesus is saying this to his disciples. He said, but who do you say that I am? Jesus had just said, hey, who does the world say that I am? Who do other people say that I am? And they got through giving all sorts of different answers. And then he, Jesus asked them a question. But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter, one of my favorite People in scripture replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's pray this morning. God, thanks for the opportunity to meet. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this church. Thank you for your church the opportunity for us to get together across the nation, across the world this morning and uh, in different time zones and different places. We know that there are people that are meeting in your name and we're so grateful. We pray that as we look and as we study and as we um, dig a little bit deeper that we would realize what part we have to play in your body and in your church. Thank you for giving us community, for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. So this verse has been uh, taken out of context in certain situations. Again, some of this has to do with translation issues, right? So we're translating from uh, Hebrew. In this, in this situation, it's actually Aramaic that we're, that we're translating from. And so the way that sentences are put together can kind of be confusing. And so some people look and say, okay, Jesus is saying, you are Peter, and on you, Peter, I am building my church. So that's kind of where we where people got the idea for a pope and, and some other some other things. Again, I'm not I'm not pointing at anybody. I'm not being mean. I'm just saying that when we when we look at scripture, especially when you study the original languages, that's not actually what Jesus is saying. He says the whole point of this narrative, Jesus is saying, Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, You are Christ, the Son of the living God. And then he says, that's right, Peter, and just as you are Peter, on the rock of the truth that you just spoke about who I am, I will build my church. 
Not on you as a person, not on any individual, not on any um, uh, establishment. I'm going to build my church on the truth that I am Christ, the Son of the living God. What does the word church mean? It comes from a Greek word found in the New Testament. We actually don't see the word church. We, We see the word ekklesia. Ecclesia, and that word means a gathering or an assembly of believers. That's all it is. That's all it is, and it's so much more. I'm not diminishing the church, but what I'm saying is we've put so much into it. And again, I love all of the, I've been to uh, Montreal and some other places where the, the, the gorgeous cathedrals and all of that, and uh, that's, that's awesome. I, I can appreciate the art and all the things that go into that, but sometimes we put so much of our thought and and, um, our belief into a location, but that's not what it is. You know, we just had folks that came back from the Amazon, you know, driving down the river, and there are people that just meet on on the side of the river. That's the church, right? We are the church. They are the church, a gathering and assembly. Matter of fact, ecclesia at the time didn't even have a religious connotation. It was just a gathering of people. And it's been kind of adopted now, and now ecclesia is, is what is used to talk about the church. It's not a place, it's the people. Church really isn't about where, it's about who. And the who doesn't start with you. Hashtag connect church Arab. <laughs> the who doesn't start with you. The who starts with Jesus. Everything we do is going to be built off of the rock, Christ Jesus, who is the son of the everlasting God. We are called to be the church. So what does that mean? I'm going to give you, it's actually six points, but we're going to go through them really fast. I promise you guys are like, oh, come on. No, don't worry. It's, it's fine. Because I want to talk about three purposes of the church, and then in your notes, you have the three reasons why the church is called the bride of Christ, which is what we're going to get into in just a minute. What are the three purposes of the church? Why are we here? I believe that, as Pastor Keith has said 100,000 times, that not, not only but I believe that the church exists for those who are not here yet. Matthew chapter 18 tells us that we are to go and to make disciples of all nations and to baptize them and to teach them the things that God has taught, uh, that God has taught us. And then Jesus says, I'm going to be with you to the, even to the end of the age. We exist uh, as Christ followers and as a church to reach those who are far from God. Who those who maybe have, have a relationship with God and fell away, or those that don't have a relationship with God, and then we introduce them to the living God. But here it is. Number one, we have a ministry to God, right? We, we minister to God as we praise and bless the name of Jesus. That's part of why we open our services with worship. We want to welcome God into this place. Again, not that God needs welcoming to come anywhere, but we want to say, God, we're we're. We're glorifying you. We are ministering to you, God. It makes a difference. It's not a concert for us. It's not, now don't get me wrong, these musicians that are on the stage could absolutely put on a concert for us, right? Amen, Amen. thank you. I was waiting for it, right? They're good enough. That's not what it is. We reach for excellence. We want to be excellent, but we want to be excellent for God, not for us, not to impress not to say, oh, look how hip and great we are and you know, all of that kind of stuff. We want to use what we have at our disposal, the talents and the treasures that's God, that God has given us in order to minister to him. Say, God, you are good. You are great. Let me sing of your worthiness. That's why we do it. We want to minister to God in that way. The psalmist says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his holy name. He was talking about the idea that we're to magnify the name of Jesus, and as we do, his presence grows bigger and goes deeper in our lives. Worship is the natural overflow of a grateful heart. 
When we have gratitude for God for what he's done, worship is just the natural overflow. We say, God, I, I don't know what else to do but to say thank you. And what does that look like? It doesn't have to necessarily look like a praise song or a hymn. It could look like a lot of different things. But worship is that natural overflow. We are here to minister to God. And we don't just minister through music. We minister, I'll tell you right now, Barbara Buckhannon is in the other room ministering to children. She's serving, and that is ministering to God's heart. Because he is receiving the glory of his name being honored, his story being told, his love being shown. We serve as we clean the bathrooms, as we make coffee. Trey Stanfield, every Sunday, takes out the garbage. Nobody asks him to, and I'm not calling him out to lift him up. I'm saying he is worshiping. He is giving God honor and glory for, what, for who he is because he loves God, and he wants to minister to him. Number two, we minister to others. We're here to minister to God, ultimately, first and foremost. Everything that we say, everything that we do is going to be run through this book. And if anything that I say or do goes against what this book says, I want you as a church to call me out on it. I want someone to say, no, that's not right. And I can either explain myself or I can say, whoops, or I can, you know, whatever, but everything that we do needs to be run through the filter of this. We are God's people. This is God's word. Everything runs through this filter. We minister to God and we minister to each other. We come here to worship together. The Bible says do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves. It's important. For us to get together. You'll hear people that say that all the time. I know I've talked about this before. Oh, man, you know, I go for walks in nature. That's my church. <laughs> That's not true. That's not what God's called us to do. Don't get me wrong. Walks in nature are great. Do that. But don't replace biblical community with that. And then try to pass it off as church. That's not what it is. That's not what it is. We're not called to do this thing alone. Preaching means to proclaim. That's part of what we do when we're here on Sunday. And it's not about hearing from me. Trust me. It's not about hearing from me. It's about hearing from God. My prayer every Sunday is that I would get out of the way, that God would speak and do what he does. And there are some Sundays, y'all, I'm just in complete and full honesty. There are some Sundays where I was like, wow, I shouldn't have even gotten up there. We just should have done worship all day and then left. And then there's been people that have come up and that that was a really powerful moment for me. And I'm like, were you listening? Like, I don't even know what just happened. Did you fall asleep? What happened in there? But because but, God can do that. And so I try to prepare as best I can, but I can promise you, I don't want you to hear my opinions. And I have opinions. I don't want you to hear them. I want you to hear the truth of God's word. I want you to hear what God is trying to speak to you in a very plain way. It's proclamation of God's truth. I had a, uh, a teacher in seminary who said it this way. He said, I would rather be left with the honest questions that scripture leads me with, leaves me with, than to put my faith in man-made answers. I loved that. I was like, you know what? I'd rather have questions that I can't answer than try to answer them for God. Why are we so afraid of mysteries sometimes? Let the mysteries be the mysteries. And we'll trust God. We'll trust God. We are here to minister to others. God is so great because even though we're different part, we're a different part of our faith journey. God is so big that he can speak intimately into each and every one of us, no matter where we are. And it's not just from the stage. You all are proclaiming truth to each other as you serve, as you love, as you speak truth. You don't have to have a Bible college degree or a seminary degree to be able to speak truth and to proclaim that's what we challenge you to do every day is to proclaim the truth of who 
he is. The last one is this, ministry to the world. God has called us to minister to those that are far from him. We could be the church as we go to school, which you guys are about to start doing again. Womp womp. We can be the church as we go to work. We can be the church in our marriage. Now, again, I'm not saying that our marriage is the church. I'm saying we can represent the church in all of these different areas. We shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't be ashamed. We should be bold and we should be courageous as we step into the darkness with the light of Jesus to minister to other people. And I know sometimes, I know sometimes it can be scary, it can be uncomfortable. But sometimes that's the one thing that people, always the gospel is what people need to hear. But as we start acting like the church, we're gonna see why in the book of Acts the church blew up the way that it did. Why people started coming in droves to Christ because these people were different because Jesus had changed their hearts and their minds. One of the most weird metaphors, I should say weird, um, specific metaphors that Paul uses, he talks about us as being the body of Christ, he talks about us as being building blocks, living bricks that are placed one on top of another, as, as building some sort of a, a, a cathedral. But he also talks about the church as the bride of Christ. I'll be honest, before I was married, that confused me, and it was a little weird, okay? So I was kind of like, nah, I'm not sure if I'm tracking with you on that. Ephesians, turn to Ephesians, New Testament. We're gonna pop through this real fast. These are the points that are in your outline. You guys are like, he's just getting to the outline? Don't worry, this is gonna go fast. Galatians, Ephesians. Chapter 5, you guys have probably heard this again if you've been around church, verses 25 through 32. We'll read this to you. 25, did I say Galatians? Yeah, Galatians, Ephesians. <laughs> I was on the wrong book. It's fine. I'll get there. Speaking of Bible college degrees. 25, 25 through uh, 32. Husbands, listen up, husbands. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his mother and cleave, I'm sorry, hold fast to his wife, the two shall become one flesh. 32, I'm going to read it to you. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. He's using a metaphor here. He's talking about this idea of husband and wife and marriage. And he's saying this is much like the relationship between Christ and the church. And if you're anything like me, uh, you go, I hope Jesus does a better job of loving me than I do of loving my wife. I love my wife, but I fail because I'm a human. God loves us perfectly because he is God. You know, what's interesting that Rachel is, you know, my partner and outside of Jesus, she's the most important person to me. That's just the way that it is. Um, we've been on this journey together for uh, almost 20 years. <whistles> almost 20 years. This next year will be 20 20 years together. And you know, it's interesting because I was thinking about how crazy it would be if you said, if someone walked up to me and was like, Matt, I love you, dude. Like, I, like you rock. I get that a lot. But 
if people, if people were just to say that to me, but they're like, but your wife, I can't stand her. <laughs> Actually, I get that a lot too. No, I'm just kidding. I don't. That doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. Like, like, what would my reaction be? Right? Like, what? I'd be like, huh? That, that, those two things can't be, can't be separated. You can't say that you love me and say that you don't love my wife because we are one. We are the same. We are uh, in this together throughout the mistakes that I make, throughout the mistakes that she makes. We are in this together. So it's funny to me when people do that uh, with the church. Man, I love Jesus. I love God. Pfft, I hate the church. I'm like, nope, not true. That you don't love Jesus, you don't love God as much as you say you do because God loves the church. God created the church as his bride for the purpose of ministering, ministering to us so we can minister to him so that we can make his name known to all of everyone that is around us. Three reasons the church is called the bride of Christ. I have one minute. Here we go. Number one, intimacy. God allows us to have intimacy with him. Now, don't get weird on me. We're not talking about that kind of intimacy, right? We've, we've turned that word into something that always means something sexual, and that's not the case. Intimacy is that close bond that, that, that God does not desire to walk with us at a distance. God wants to be right there with us, and he is. The Bible says he's knocking on the door. What's our response? God, walk with me. Carry me when I cannot walk myself. A metaphor is something that brings resemblance to your life. God is trying to find something on this earth to show us the level of intimacy that he wants to have with us. Intimacy ultimately is about trust. God wants us to trust him. Because he's worthy. Because he's worthy. Number two, protection. I don't know if you know this about me, but I am a lethal weapon. Uh, you laughed really quick. Greg? I hurt myself when I did that. <laughs> right, protection. Part of, part of what that is uh, from a husband to a wife is that there's, and in that relationship is men, we feel this uh, not Again, not ladies that you can't take care of yourself. It's nothing like that. I'm not putting, putting you down. What I'm saying is that we feel this level of protection, that it's, that it's part of our job to make sure that our families are safe. Jesus does that for us. Verse, verses 25 uh, through 29 talks about all of this to, to present us, uh, the church, to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle, and love your wives as our own bodies. Protect, protect our, uh, what, what, what it is that we love so much. Do we, sometimes I don't think we always realize how much God protects us. We always think about all the bad things that happen. And again, I, I don't want us to focus so much on all the bad things that could happen, right? Because that'll take a long time. But God is doing great things. He's protecting his church. He's protecting his word. He's protecting those that he loves. And that doesn't always mean that we're going to walk through life without having any sort of issues or without having any sort of um, frustrations or even without having to give our life for the sake of the cross. That's not the protection I'm talking about. Jesus has saved us, and he told us um, that you're in the palm of God's hand and nobody can take you out. God has secured us in our relationship with him. I am taking Krav Maga now, though, so I'm, I'm, I'm almost, I'm working my way. Brian's trying to teach me how to be a lethal weapon. Last one is this, number three, rights. God has granted us certain rights as his bride. We have rights because of Jesus, not because of who we are, but when we trust in Jesus, we are gifted his righteousness 
and we are given certain rights as the position that we hold with Christ. Because Rachel is my wife, she has the right to speak on my behalf, and often does, right? And often does better than me. You want to see a pre preacher's wife get mad? Get her on the phone with an incompetent salesperson or somebody doing, uh, doing something for uh, the internet. This way that happened this last week. Not that I'm telling on her, but it did, right? You want to see there to be, but it's not, it's not, oh, let me talk to your husband. No, you don't have to speak to Mr. Chandler. You're speaking with Mrs. Chandler. Thank you very much. Most often I send her, I'm like, she does the heavy lifting around here. I'm like, there's a scary guy in the driveway. Can you go home? Can you take care of that? <laughs> you much? Right, but, but there, are, there are rights. And again, I want us to understand the positional situation here. I'm almost done, I promise. But I want us to understand the positional situation. We're not saying, women, that you need us to give you rights. Jesus, Jesus gives you. This is, this is what I'm saying to you, Okay. It's the relationship between husbands and wives, especially in this day and age where women were not valued as much as they should have been. And Jesus is saying, when you, as the bride of Christ, as the church, you have all the rights that I'm, that I'm bestowing upon you because you are my bride, because I love you. That's for all of us in this room. I know it's weird sometimes for the guys who are like, oh, I'm not a bride, buddy. But yeah, no, we are. We're, we're the church. We're the bride of Christ. Jesus loves us enough to give us the very righteousness of Jesus and tells us that we are held to the same, that he views us through that lens. Not that we are sinners saved by grace, but that we are the righteousness of Christ, sons and daughters of God, his bride who he loves, who he protects, and who he has an intimate relationship with. Let's declare and decide in our spirit that we're going to be the church. We know who we are. We're the ecclesia. It's been given to us. So let's act like it. Let's step out in authority. I have the rights, I have his protection. I have an intimate relationship with him and he has called me to share that with everyone because he doesn't just love me and he doesn't just love the church. He loves the whole world. Let's bow our heads and pray this morning. We're gonna have an opportunity to respond as the church, which is why I love opportunities like we are gonna have this afternoon to get together together um, all three campuses, we've talked about this before, we are one church in three locations, and we truly believe that. That is, that is uh, what we strive to be. You know that we, you guys hear the same messages uh, on Sunday mornings, and you, uh, or your children receive the same teaching, and your youth receive the same teaching. We're led by a group of elders across all three campuses, We are one church. And we have such an opportunity to love well. And today, and especially in the, in the upcoming months, we're not gonna see a whole lot of love. Anytime it's there, there's an election cycle, uh, we don't see a whole lot of love. We see a whole lot of people getting mad at each other for really silly reasons. Here's what I wanna challenge you. Can we be the church? Can we understand that God wants to have an, an intimate relationship with a, a close relationship with us? That he desires for us to trust in him for his protection. And that he has given us rights as the bride of Christ to be who he's called us to be. This morning, if, if, if that's a relationship that seems odd to you, that seems outside of the norm, it might be because you haven't trusted in Christ. We do this nearly every Sunday. We want to give people, always want to give people an opportunity 
to trust in Jesus. If we don't do that, what are we doing? So Jesus said that anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The Bible doesn't give us specific words we need to speak or any specific thing we need to do. He just says that those who believe in your heart, that Jesus is God and that God has raised him from the dead and that he died for our sins, that through that, and we confess that with our mouth and believe it in our heart, God will save us. Maybe there's someone here, every head's bowed, every eye's closed, nobody's looking around. Maybe there's someone here that says, you know what, I haven't trusted Christ, but this morning I want to. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm asking you to be brave. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to have you come forward. I'm just going to pray with you. Maybe you're here in this room, you say, you know, I haven't trusted Jesus. But man, I want to I trust Christ this morning. Just pop your hand up real fast. I promise I'll see you. I'm not going to call you out. I just want, amen. I just want to be able to pray with you this morning. Maybe you're at home and that's your story this morning. Very simple for us. We confess, we believe, we call on the name of Jesus. Something like this, Jesus, I believe that you died for me in my sin, that you rose from the dead on the third day, and that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. And I ask today that you'd forgive me, you'd take away my sin, that you'd separate it as far as the east is from the west. You would help me to live a life that honors you. Thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your heads bowed, your eyes closed. Maybe this morning, if you responded in that way, let us know, communicate through the cards, through the um, codes on the back of the chairs, online, you can let us know. Maybe you're here this morning, you say, you know what, I feel like I have been an attender of the church and not the church and I want to be the body of Christ I'm not going to call you out I just want to pray over you I want to pray with you if that's you this morning it says I want God to change in me so that I can be the church in my family at my work at my school on Sundays whatever that looks like I can be what God has called me to be. If that's you this morning, just pop your hand up. I promise I'll pray. Amen. See all those hands. Jesus, for all of us this morning, I pray that you would help us to be your church. We already are your church, but that God, we can move that outside of this building and into our communities, into our homes, that we can be representations of who you are. God, if you've called us to do something, to, to turn our hearts towards ministry, to serve, to love, whatever that looks like, help, help us not to look at church as a Sunday activity, but to realize that we are part of a family that has been saved by grace all week long. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for how you love us. Pray you'd bless us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and stand with us as we sing.